the prophet Daniel, please. The book of Daniel, chapter number 3. It's from this chapter where we'll find our text through which God wants to speak to us this morning. The book of Daniel, please. And we're in chapter 3. And I'm sure this morning you, as well as I, we know the events and we know what's happening in this chapter. You remember that King Nebuchadnezzar, that great Gentile, wicked, cruel, pagan monarch, how he sets up this great golden image in the plain of Dura, and how he brings and makes this great command that whenever the music plays, every people and every nation and every language is to bow down to this golden image and worship the image. And then there was one day came. The day came for three young men, and they had a choice to make. Now, this choice to make, either they were going to bow to the great golden image or they were going to take their stand for God. And when everybody bowed when the music started, three young men were found standing. They weren't going to compromise their convictions, no matter about the consequences. And we're going to take up our reading in verse number 8 of Daniel chapter number 3. Verse 8 we read, and Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and, and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbuff, psaltery, and dusselmer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worship worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded them, to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, or an dulcimer, and all kinds of music ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And old Nebuchadnezzar was given these boys a second chance. Look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up on. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And then these men were bound in their coats and their hosen and their hats and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame 
the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and, and said unto the, his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt in the form of the fourth like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes and governors and captains and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, whom upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their heads singed, neither were their coats changed nor the smell of fire had passed on them. And then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And we know that the Lord will bless the reading of his own precious truth. In the book of Daniel this morning, if you would just take the time and read through the book of Daniel, what you'll find in those 12 chapters, you'll find great teachings that will enrich the heart of the child of God. There are many many different great teachings in the book of Daniel. If you mention the book of Daniel, many people can pick out the great prophetical teachings. Because mind you, the book of Daniel this morning is a book this morning that has, con contains great prophetical teachings. Prophetic, prophetical teachings to do with the nation great prophetical teachings to do with the Jew, great prophetical teaching. And the book of Daniel certainly holds before us God's great calendar for the nations and for His people and for days to come. But you know, many of those great prophecies that are found in Daniel, they're no longer prophetical. They were prophetical in Daniel's day, but they're not prophetical today. They're now historical because between the day Daniel received them to the day we are now living in, many of those great prophecies have already been fulfilled. And if you were to go through the book of Daniel with a good, simple, clear commentary, Warren Wersbury, and you go through Daniel chapter 11, you'll find that the his, history books and the prophecy of Daniel, that every prophetic statement in Daniel 11, most of them, there's a few yet still to be fulfilled, were fulfilled right to the very second. And you know, friend, this morning, that just proves God keeps His promises. And God fulfills every aspect of prophecy. And there's a the great prophetical teaching. But in the book of Daniel, you'll find that there's great political teachings in the book of Daniel. If there's ever a book that teaches, has lessons to do with, with politics, etc., 
It's the book of Daniel. Because it's the book of Daniel that teaches us that the Most High God ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. You know, friends, this morning the book of Daniel has great political teaching. Daniel 2, 21 says that he removeth kings and setteth up kings. And you know, dear friend, what the book of Daniel teaches us this morning that it's God that controls political leaders. And it's God that controls the affairs of our world. It's God this morning that removeth kings, and it's God that sets kings on their thrones. Let me say this. It's God that put Queen Elizabeth II on the throne. And it's God that has kept her on the throne. And it'll be God in His time that will remove her from it. You see, here's another wee lesson that we learn. It says, He governeth among the nations. Everybody's panicking about Brexit. Everybody's panicking, now we're better in, now we're better out. But wait till I tell you, God's governing Brexit. God's governing the affairs of this nation. Don't you think it's Theresa May? God's controlling the, governing the nations. And God's governing all that's going on in our nation. And I'll tell you this, He governs what's going up in Stormont, whether we like it or whether we don't. And He's governed all that's going down in the free state as well. There's great prophetical teachings in the book of Daniel, and there's great political teachings in the book of Daniel. But sometimes we overlook the most important teachings in the book of Daniel, and that's the practical teachings in the book of Daniel. Because in the book of Daniel, you have great pr practical teachings. And mind you, they're teachings relevant for our day and generation. If there's ever a book you want to get good practical teaching on how to live for God and how to stand for God and how to be true for God in these days and generations and how to trust God when everything and everyone's against us, you'll find it in the book of, the book of Daniel. You know, here we have three men this morning, three young men. And these three young men were prepared to stand for God. They were prepared to be true to God and live for God in spite of the, of the consequences that they face. But there's something that I, that God brought to my mind this week. You know, friend, their faithfulness to God provoked a reaction from old Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king. And my text this morning is actually the very words that he quoted here in verse 25. He answered and said, he said this, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and of no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. That's the text for this morning's meeting. And it was the faithfulness of these three Hebrews that provoked this reaction. I want you to notice, first of all, in that text, three things what he saw. First of all, who he saw, he says, Lo, I see four men. Do you know what we have to remind our hearts this morning, and it's this? Living for God won't keep you out of trouble. And being true to God won't keep you out of trouble either. And you know, child of God, this morning sometimes... When we really live for God and we're going to stand for God, sometimes it'll lead you into trouble rather than keep you out of it. 
And I wonder this morning, child of God, if you and I were in that place where we knew that standing for God was going to bring us into trouble, I wonder are we prepared to stand, and I wonder would we prepare to be true. I heard a man saying on one occasion, and he talked a pile of nonsense, but this is the nonsense he taught. When trouble comes, and problems, and sorrows, and all these things comes into the life of a believer, and believers are going through horrible times, trying times, he taught that it's because, because they've sinned somewhere along the line. That's why Christians suffer, he said. That's why Christians face difficult times, because it's God's way of punishing them for the sin that they've done. And I think they're fools for saying that, and I think they're bigger fools for believing them. I don't think for one moment it was sin in the lives of these three young men that put them into the burning, fiery furnace. They don't think it was sin that put Daniel into the lion's den either. And I don't think it was sin in the life of Jeremiah that put him into the dungeon of where he was sinking in the deep mud. And I don't think it was sin either that caused Job to go through the heartache and the pain that he suffered. Not at all. It wasn't sin It was their lives that glorified God. Do you know something, child of God, what the devil hates? The devil hates a life that glorifies God. The devil hates a life that exalts the Savior. And if your life exalts the Savior, and if your life and my life glorifies God, then, friend, we become a, a target of the devil. Who we saw. You know what I love about about this wee text this morning. It teaches me that when Nebuchadnezzar threw these three men into the burning fairy furnace, he didn't rub his hands and say, that's, the, that's rid of them three boys. No, he didn't. He didn't. Did you notice what Nebuchadnezzar did when these three men who were determined to die for their God, do you know what he did? He didn't walk away. He sat and he watched what would happen. Do you know what Nebuchadnezzar was watching for? Even though he was in a rage, he wanted to see something. He wanted to see if these three men truly believed in what they believed. He wanted to see if the faith of these three men was real. That's why he didn't walk away. He wanted to see these three men prove their God and he wanted these three men to prove their faith. Let me say something this morning. Maybe you work in a difficult place. Maybe you're the only Christian where you work. And you're listening to all the old foul language that the world could speak. And they may scorn you, they may scorn me, they may scorn the whole lot of us and call us for all the names under the sun. But let me say something this morning. They're watching you. And they're watching me. 
And I'll say something else about this. They're not only watching you and watching me, but they're really watching when the going gets tough. One thing that stands out to the world is how Christians react in difficult times. Oh, the world will watch how Christians react in difficult times. The Friday evening when I was over at, at Kilhorn Parish in the week of our teaching week, I told the story of that, how that day at half past one I got a phone call from a man whose wife was in terrible trouble. I know him and I know her as well as anybody that's in here. And she was being blamed for something that you didn't do. And both her and him are soundly saved, Christians. And when she was arrested, mind you, she was arrested, and she was brought to wherever the police brought her to. And witnesses witnessed against her. And mind you, she hadn't much to go on. The authorities told her the best thing to do was to confess and say you did it, and all you would do would suffer a slap on the wrist and you get off. But if you don't confess to it, it'll mean three years in prison. She told the authorities, I'm not going to confess to this or say anything that I did it. She just says that's telling lies. And because I'm a Christian, I'm not going to tell these, no matter about your professional advice. That's not really professional advice at all. That's pure and utter corruption. And this lady told them, I'm prepared to go to prison if I have to go to prison. Because I didn't do it. And I don't care how many witnesses you have. She says, God is my witness. Fourteen long months passed up to this Friday a week ago. Fourteen long, hard months. Preparing herself for the worst. And all these people were trying to tell her to sign the thing and get it over with. A slap on the wrist is better than three years in prison. She wouldn't do it no matter about their advice. And shortly before the big court case came up there the other day, new evidence came. And she, she stood in the dock. She says it was the darkest day she ever experienced. And through it all, she wondered where was God. Listen, child of God, you listen to this story because this could be you and it could be me. You could be blamed for something that you won't, didn't even do, and you could be blamed for something that you weren't even there. So just listen. And she stood on the dock. Thinking the worst. And right to the very last second she held on. Being true to what God told her to do, be honest. And the judge looked at her, standing directly in front of him. And the judge told her, Mrs. So-and-so, I'm not going to mention her name because it's personal. On the evidence that I've been given, 
and of the nature of matter that this is in. I see no case for you to answer. You're free to go. It pays you to tell the truth, no matter what professional advice you give. I just give. And these three young men stood their ground, even though it could mean them burned to death. But look at something else. Look at what he saw. He says, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. Listen, dear child of God, the devil may determine this morning. He may determine the trouble that comes. He may determine the fire. He may determine the persecutions. He may de determine the suffering, I the suffering. The devil may determine the fire. He may determine the pain. He may determine the suffering. He may determine the persecution. Ah, but it's God that designs it. God designs it. God designs oftentimes what the devil determines, and God uses it to do things, and it's for our good. You see, child of God, when I read this story, I notice that the Lord doesn't step in just at the mouth of the furnace and stop it. The Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to bind these three fellows. And the Lord allowed the men to lift these three fellows. And the Lord allowed it for these three men to be cast in. God didn't stop it. Because God allowed it. And maybe this morning, child of God, there's somebody here. This morning. And I want you to notice something here else. In verse 20, it says that they were the mighty men bound to three. These three young men, they were powerless in themselves. They could do nothing for themselves. They were bound. And maybe there's somebody here this morning. I don't know. Listen, I just have to bring what the Lord tells me to bring and nothing else. And maybe you're facing something very near. And it's overwhelming. And like these three young men, you feel powerless to do anything about it. And the enemy has you burned. The enemy can bind us just the way Nebuchadnezzar can bind everybody else. Notice they were bound before they went into it. Do you know something? You see, when trouble's up ahead and you're facing some difficult situation, the devil will see to it that you're bound. Why is he? Well, I'll tell you how I know that, for I know it, because he's tried to bind me many a time, and has. He'll bind you with the ropes of doubt. He'll bind you with the ropes of fear. He'll bind you with the ropes, which is far worse than them to self-sufficiency. And he'll bind you with all these ropes that will make you feel powerless as you face it. But look what Nebuchadnezzar sees. Look what he saw. I see four men loose. You know, friend, God allowed them to go into the fire. These three men were helpless. They could do nothing for themselves. 
But there's something about these three men that I wish I had. The first one was real conviction. The second one, they had real courage to face the fire. Ah, but I'll tell you something else they had. They had real confidence, confidence in the God that they trusted. But there's something else that God wants us to see. God used the fire to set them free from what Nebuchadnezzar had them tied up on. Notice the fire didn't burn their coats. Notice the fire didn't burn their hats. Notice the fire didn't even singe their hair. Notice the fire didn't even make them smell of fire. But anything the fire destroyed was what Nebuchadnezzar had tied them up with. And sometimes, child of God, sometimes God has to allow us to go through the fire to get rid of what the devil has placed upon us. Sometimes the furnace may be too hot, but it's that that God sees is needed to polish and to shine our lives and our testimonies. They were bound going in, but they were blessed coming out. Spurgeon had an old, the story is told, he had an old ivory handle that of a knife that his grandfather had. A member of his congregation was a blacksmith, and he happened to show the handle to one, one day to the blacksmith and says, could you make me a handle or a blade for this, for this handle? Certainly. Bring it down someday, and Spurgeon brought it down. And, and the blacksmith, he rattled, he rattled through all this waste metal and steel, whatever it was, and picked out this piece of steel. It was dull. It looked worthless. And he threw it down and he says, perfect. Come back in ten days, Mr. Spurgeon, and I'll have your knife. And see it, Spurgeon, come back to the blacksmith. And when he returned, there was this handle that he gave him and a lovely blade that glittered in the sun. And old Spurgeon said, and that, 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 that's not the piece of metal that, that you threw on the table, he says, that's the piece of metal. He says, maybe you could preach in this sometime, Mr. Spurgeon. And you take a look at that and see how beautiful the fire has made a dull piece of metal into something that is shiny and into something so beautiful. You see, sometimes the devil determines the trouble, but God designs the trouble to make us more like his son. You know why? Because there's so much dross in all of us that there's things that only the fire can take from us to make us shine for him. I see four men loose. There was who he saw, what he saw. I'm finished now with whom he saw. He's looking at the fourth man now. And this Gentile pagan king that he was recognized him. The fourth man is like unto the Son of God. Do you know, child of God, it's when we're in the fire and it's when we're going through the mill and it's when we're going through terrible times that if we look to God and trust Him the whole way through it, the unsaved will see Christ with us. Notice Nebuchadnezzar didn't see the fourth man outside the furnace. No, no. The fourth man the Son of God was revealed while they were there. While they were in the fire, Christ was brought before Nebuchadnezzar. Notice the effect that it had. Look at verse number 24. Look at, look at his emotion. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. Look at his exercise. He rose up in haste. Look at his, his exclamation. Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? The fourth is the, like the Son of God. Did you know from that moment Nebuchadnezzar was never the same? From that moment he was never to be the same again. God uses our troubles to polish our testimony. Maybe for someone here, the furnace isn't far away. In fact, the furnace mightn't be too far away from me. Don't look at the furnace as something that destroys. Look at the furnace as something that God uses to design you and me into the image of His Son. Whatever you do, child of God, you stand for God. You remain true to God. This lady I was telling you about, I'm not finished with her, I'm finishing her with this, with her. Through the 14 dark months, she had more people who had no time for God who didn't even think of God. Through those 14 months, she had more people coming to her and saying to her that they never believed in God. until they saw what she went through. And what this lady went through, the outside world that had no time for God, many of them, has now believed that there is a God. And doors has opened wholesale for her to tell them people all about Jesus. God puts us through the mill, but he takes us through the mill. And that's what Job said, when he hath tried me, I will come forth as gold. May God bless us and encourage us through his word this morning. Our